Hey everyone, this is Pete Perusik, and I want to welcome you to this edition of the Weathered Athlete Podcast, a place for us to honor those athletes that refuse to go quietly into the night. As a weathering triathlete and a physical therapist, I will spend my time talking with those athletes that continue to make the necessary repairs and continue to move forward. They may have a few cracks in their foundation or a squeaky step, and their patinas may continue to fade, but they are no less glorious than years prior. In fact, I feel they have more heart and resolve as they have weathered and can provide the pathway and set the standard that we should all live by. My goal is to determine what sets these individuals apart from the rest of society. Don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a comment, and share with your friends. Today I'm honored to be joined by Ann Marquez for mile number 22. She has such an incredible journey to get to this point in her life. I am so humbled and thankful she was willing to open up really for the first time publicly regarding the storm she has weathered over the years, including alcoholism, breast cancer, divorce, and severe depression. Instead of waiting for the storms to destroy her, she took the necessary steps to improve her situation and to work to clear the sky around her by taking up weight training and modeling. She has started her own business as a fitness trainer and has set a goal to help others succeed in fitness and life. The thing I love about her journey is that she continues to take on life with love and excitement, and that includes even shoveling snow, which I'm sure she is doing a lot of in Minnesota. I hope you enjoy. Well, and I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it is so, it, it's awesome to meet you. It's good to meet you. Thank you for this opportunity. Oh, you're welcome. You have such an uh, amazing story from what I read. So before we get into all the really cool things you've been doing, um, are you from Minnesota? I am. I was uh, born in Cleveland, but my family was originally from Minnesota. My father was a businessman. So I was born in Ohio when he was working there, but we're a Minnesota family and I've lived here since I was six. Okay. In the same area? Kind of, well, you're in Eden Prairie? I'm in Eden Prairie now. I grew up in St. Paul. It's the Twin Cities area. Okay. So other than college, this is where I've been my whole life. Oh, okay. Um, so were you athletic growing up? Not at all. And actively discouraged from being athletic. Um, I'm the youngest of my parents, five children. And I think from just a logistics standpoint, it would have been really tough to have five kids in a lot of sports. Yeah. Um, although I'm a lot younger than my other siblings, I'm kind of an oops baby. I could have had those opportunities, but my parents uh, were consistent in their parenting and that when we were in high school, we needed to go get jobs and okay. start a new life. So I was, um, I guess, not discouraged from being athletic, but I was not supported in being in formal athletics in junior high, high school, and college. Okay. So really not much, even like, you know, maybe not for sports, but even, you know, doing other stuff. Not oh, I was a wild little kid. Um, I really <laughs> wanted to be a gymnast. And so I would spend hours turning cartwheels in our backyard, doing somersaults, headstands, everything. I was active, yeah. just not in a sort of formal sense. Okay. And then how about for college? Um, where'd you go? I went to the College of St. Benedict, which is in central Minnesota, about an hour and a half north of where my home was. Um, it was long, far enough away that the umbilical cord still stretched, but my mother wouldn't be showing up to have lunch with me every day. Um, <laughs> and then when I went to college, Pete, I'm going to be real honest. I went to college to drink beer. And that's <laughs> what I did. I majored in French. I got a BA in French. I managed to graduate eight semesters, but I went to school, not with the stated intent. It just ended up being that I partied for four years and I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> so how'd that turn into uh, work after that? Uh, well, when I graduated from college, I was uh, supposed to be, my family's career track for me was to go to law school. Okay. And I had been going to school full-time, basically, uh, up until that, I was 22 years old, and I was burned out. I was ready to not be a student anymore, so I didn't go to law school, but I sure liked partying. <laughs> so I got a job in a party atmosphere. I worked in bars and restaurants for a couple of years. And, you know, was was leading the life every 20 year old, you know, someone in their 20s is supposed to be living. I was experimenting with my adulthood yeah. and uh, was making money and doing things like that. But alcohol, men, <laughs> drugs became much, much more important. Yeah. And as fate would have it, one morning I woke up when I was 26 years old, I was pregnant. Uh -huh. So life sent me a little warning sign that maybe I wasn't living the life. I, I could be living 
yeah. you know, uh, with, with fulfillment and happiness and joy. Mine was all about the next party. There yeah. was no long-term goals. So when I had my baby, I was forced to confront everything in my life, how I made money, uh, what I was doing on a day-to-day basis. And now I had somebody that I had to take care of. Yeah. So when I turned 26 is when I really turned into an adult. Yeah. Uh, I had a nine to five job. I was a single mother for 10 years. Uh, the partying came to an end, the smoking, the drinking, the men, it all came to an end. Yeah. And I uh, was raising my little girl and I was doing exactly what I was told to do my entire life. I, uh, you know, had the job, I had the house, we did vacations, I did the clothing. I had, you know, the white girl suburban life that my family wanted me to have. Yeah. But I was miserable, Pete. Yeah. I had this baby, but I wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't doing any work that was worthy of me. And I started to fall into a depression over that decade. The conflict in my head of loving being a parent and the conflict of wanting to be a party girl and couldn't do that, my identity was all wrong. I needed to make some cohesiveness out of that. So uh, after the 10 years of being a single mother, I did end up getting married and had a couple of more kids, plus had a stepchild that came into me through that marriage as well. So suddenly I went from being a single mother to being a suburban housewife with four kids i had exactly what my family always wanted me to have at age 40 the house the kids the the life um something that they could be proud of and brag about to their friends about look at what our daughter look at what our sister is doing finally she has gotten her act together and she's being an adult um but i wasn't happy i was miserable I was crying all the time. It felt like we were broke all the time, although I was married to an executive. Things just weren't working. And it took me a while. And here's where we're getting to the heart of this conversation of what was my aha moment. Yeah. I woke up on October 31st, 2013, Halloween day, probably hungover. Yeah. And I decided this is it. I am going to get my life together. I'm going to give life one more college try. And if I didn't succeed this time, I was going to give myself permission to kill myself. That is what my depression did to me. It took away my will to live. Horrible, horrible thing. When you've got four kids and a husband, uh, I I scared so many, many people and Mm -hmm. mostly myself. I was terrified to live, but I knew that in order to live, I needed to work at living. And so the number one thing I needed to do was get right in my head and get over the depression. Yeah. So how I did that is I started eating properly. And after one day of eating properly, I felt a little better. And then the next day I ate properly again and I felt a little bit better. And it kept happening. After about six weeks, I had only lost five pounds, yeah. but I had gained so much more in just my self-esteem. This part of my life, I can find some happiness. I can have a good relationship with food. I can now have a better relationship with myself. And so from there, from that desperation and that glimmer of hope, I built the rest of my life. So starting on October 31st, 2013 to today, I have built the life that I have dreamed of. And I'm only beginning. I've only just scratched the surface. But I want to back up just a little bit more and tell you specifically about the biggest manifestations of my depression were suicide. I was, I had lost the will to live. I was suicidal. I was actively seeking my own death. And then when I was 43, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And for me, my cancer was because of my depression. It was not a genetic thing. I know other people's experience of cancer is more of an outside force, the chemicals they were exposed to, genetics, things like that. But for me, I know in my soul that I caused my cancer because I wasn't dealing with negative emotions. All of my emotions condensed themselves into a 1.3 centimeter tumor on the bottom side of my breast. Okay. There was no depression. There was the sign of it. So I had a physical manifestation of everything that was going wrong in my head. So I used that opportunity to have the doctors take the physical malady out of me, take the tumor out, and I started working on what was going on in my head. So from um, from age 43 to 46, I kind of dealt with why did I get cancer? What was I supposed to be learning? 
And again, waking up on that Halloween day, it's like, let's take the success from having defeated cancer yeah. and use that to add success to the rest of my life. So what needs to come out? What needs to be added in? So, okay, so let's, I'm sorry, I keep time traveling here, but let's go back to 2013. Anne has decided that she wants to live and I'm going to give the old college try to life. So many things that it is, of course, I, I sought therapy. I got a professional to help me sort out what was going through my head and make some goals. Uh, some of the things that I needed to get off of my life were all of the expectations that have been put on me by my family, my church, my school, my siblings, my peers, my society. I needed to live my authentic, genuine life and I needed to pursue what I wanted to pursue in life. And one of the first things I identified was that my marriage was not what we hope our marriages would be. I married who I was supposed to marry, not who I wanted to marry. So, and he's not here to give his side of the story. So of course, I'm not gonna tell you about my divorce journey because that wouldn't be fair to my ex-husband. We did our best for 15 years, we tried. There, was no, there wasn't a lack of love. There wasn't a lack of effort. It was the outcomes of our marriage as neither of us were really growing as human beings. And I needed to get out of that marriage to give myself the fertile soil to grow. During that time, our kids were, you know, teenagers and our, our girls had already fledged the house. So um, my relationships with my family continued to develop. My children now, instead of being part of a parenting unit, now they're dealing with me as a single mother and it improved my parenting. Um, maybe I'm a control freak, but I really don't like making all my parenting decisions in committee. So, <laughs> so it was nice to be calling the shots with my kids and with my own life and the little success is buoyed after that so to give you some fodder here for your uh podcast Pete, <laughs> let me tell you what's happened since then yeah so i lost weight in from 2013 to 2014 in a 12 month period i lost 30 pounds awesome so you remember I told you about that first week, how much I, how great I felt. Imagine after 52 weeks of eating properly and losing 30 pounds. It was amazing. I reached my weight loss goal. It was time for me to set some new goals. Um, by sheer coincidence, and of course, it's a little bit of a longer story, but two separate people from two very different areas of my life at the beginning of November 2014 said, Annie, you should try bodybuilding. You'd be good at it. So one of them was a friend of mine I was having a cocktail with. Another one was a personal trainer that I had just hired to try to try to bring in the exercise component now that I had the diet part down. And both of them encouraged me to be a competitor. So I said, well, I need some new goals. I've run a marathon. I know what it's like to set a four-month physical goal. Um, so let me try this for bodybuilding. So I actually ended up training for about five months uh, to be a bodybuilder. And I walked across stage as a figure competitor, which is of the four levels of female bodybuilding. I was the second one up a little bit more muscular, a little bit more lean. And I hated how I looked. The judges hated how I looked Two uh, class competitions. I came in dead last. So there was something that I had been doing that made me feel so good, but ended up not giving me the results I wanted. So I needed to rethink actually exercise because bodybuilding, I didn't take it as a defeat. I just took it as some feedback that maybe I could be using all of this energy I'm putting into exercise and have a different outcome rather than being a competition bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. And it also being competitive as an athlete goes against my um, ideas as a parent, as a, as a friend, I'm supportive. I don't compete with people. I support them. Yeah. And that was sort of one of my epiphanies is I don't want to be an athlete competitor. I want to be an inspiration as an athlete. And as a human being. So part of my bodybuilding competition, the coach that I'd hired, part of her package was I also was able to do a photo shoot. She brought in a mm -hmm. top photographer from Toronto with a makeup artist and hair and everything. And she helped me pick outfits. And I did a photo shoot in August of 2015, very first one. And that day, the seed was planted that wow, I like modeling. I'm good at it. Yeah. It isn't glamour and fun and I get to be a princess. It's work. There's effort, um, but it's not drudgery. It's not suffering. I liked being in front of the camera, just as physically demanding as being a bodybuilder. Some of those positions that you would see me hold in those pictures that you've seen of me on yeah. Instagram, they're physically demanding. Yeah. So I am an athlete and a model. Uh, and that is how I'm making, making my income now as well. I've uh, 
as a athlete, I became a personal trainer. I went to school for six months, got a certified personal training degree, you know, got a relationship with the gym and I've built my clients for the last five years. I was doing so well. Yeah. And a year ago at this time, my uh, training business was doing so well. And I had just landed a primo modeling gig on TV. And that was March of 2020. And then everybody's life changed. In Minnesota, the day was March 17, 2020. That's when our governor shut us all down because of COVID. Yeah. So the life that I had been working for for five years suddenly was put on hold. And I was faced with the uh, opportunity to reinvent myself all over again. And so some of the things that I did as a model is I continued to pursue freelance modeling gigs. So I wasn't really getting paid for them. Freelance modeling is I would get together with a photographer and makeup artist, just like you might with some buddies and go golfing for the day. Mm -hmm. Makeup artists, photographers, models get together. We just kill time by creating art. So that is how I've continued to be a model during pandemic, although I wasn't getting commercial gigs, not really getting paid for it. I did have a few. I mean, you've seen all the commercials now. People are just doing selfies at home and submitting video clips. Yeah. I, I've done some of that modeling. But as far as showing up on set and doing the hair and the makeup and all that, to be an actress or a model for a day, uh, I still get to do that. And that's how I've you know, managed pandemic as far as that is concerned. And as a personal trainer, I've also had to completely re-deliver or re-establish my business delivery model. And that exactly where you're seeing me now is how I train my people okay. is virtually they're sitting in their living rooms with their, you know, few exercise equipment. And we're able to crack out a great workout virtually. Although I would prefer to be in the gym because I'm a really hands-on kind yeah. of girl. <laughs> uh, it's, it's working really, really well. And as fate would have it, I had this little downtime with modeling and personal training. But our society is battling this epidemic. And we are getting ourselves back out there in society again. And I'm looking forward to now going back to the gym in two days. Monday, okay. I'm going back to the gym. And I have my first paid commercial gig this week as well uh, as a model. So awesome. I feel like I've kind of come so many different circles from being depressed and wanting to die to creating a life that my society took away from me or a pandemic took away from me. And I've got it back again. So I just feel like fitness is a journey. My life is a journey. This is just the arcs. You're coming in right at the beginning of what I believe is going to be another huge arc of development in my life. Yeah, it, it's such an amazing uh, journey that you've had. And, you know, this last year, I think we've all had a kind of look inward as well with, you know, with COVID. It forced us to reevaluate things as well. What what are our real goals? Because I think some of us have been just, you just go along and you do things and you wonder why you're doing it. And then all of a sudden it gets all taken away and you're like, oh, what I thought was important maybe wasn't as important as, a, as I thought it was. Exactly. And so it, it has been, it's been a challenge, I think, for everybody. And I think one of the other things is that it also made us examine what we think our security is, mm -hmm. what is our foundational things. And for me, it wasn't um, this job that I had out in the world, uh, who I was, who I have been through pandemic is exactly who I was before I was. I'm just doing something different or living my life in a different way. I saw it as an opportunity. This whole pandemic to me has been an opportunity to once mm -hmm. again reinvent myself and present the person to the world that I really want to be, or to be my genuine, authentic self, not the Catholic school girl, not the one that was supposed to go to law school or the good little girl who married and got a big house and squeezed out a bunch of kids. Yeah. Uh, I'm just living my life the way I want to. and. Um, Life has been very, very good to me for the last five years. I have absolutely no complaints. That is awesome. I want to uh, click back on back when you were that bodybuilding, that first time when you ended up finishing last. How did you get your pick yourself back up to maybe go back and do that again or just move on? I know that's people get that first kind of, I guess, you know, you have that setback and you're thinking, well, okay, maybe this wasn't. The direction I need to go. What did you do to kind of just pick yourself back up and keep moving forward at that point? Well, again, I realized that when it came to the bodybuilding, it was a suggestion that two other people had given to me. And I was just doing what I had done my whole life. It's like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do it your way. 
And I did. So I followed just like I did. I got my college degree. I was supposed to get a college degree. I got married. I was supposed to get married. So I'm doing this bodybuilding thing. I'm following your rules. And at the end, it's like, okay, I did it your way. Now I'm going to do it my way. Mm -hmm. So it was not a kick in the teeth when the judges said, you know, you're in the judges were not mean. The judges basically said, you're just not ready. You just haven't developed enough muscle yet. I probably should have trained for 10 months, not five. Okay. That doesn't matter. I can't go back and redo that. Um, I didn't need to kick, pick myself back up because I was proud of what I had done, but all of that effort did not create something that I wanted. I did not want to be a competitive bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. And so rather than use the judge's um, feedback as a criticism, as a negative, 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 it was just an affirmation that what I was feeling was right. This wasn't the right place for me being on stage as a bodybuilder you know, 90% naked, five coats of spray tan walking across the stage asking other people to judge me is not, yeah. is, is not bringing me any fulfillment. I don't need people to reassure me. My happiness is coming from inside of me. Mm -hmm. And bodybuilding didn't really bring that out. If you see my modeling pictures, you'll see my personality coming out. I love being in front of the camera. I love yeah. smiling. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what the bodybuilding competition did for me. It was more just a litmus test is, is my life exactly where I want it to be. And that was pretty damn close. I mean, bodybuilding, I mean, being a, an athlete like that is really close to what I want to be. I just didn't want to do it on a stage. Yeah. And, and that's great that you noticed that right away uh, and then moved on to, you know, use it as a stepping stone to get you where you need yeah. to be. Yes. Uh, so as far as uh, like your, your fitness journey, start being a fitness trainer, um, how was that difficult to make that transition or was it, you just knew it was right? I knew it was right. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you asked. Cause I missed yeah. telling you this when I was training for my bodybuilding competition, I was 46 years old and an athlete, basically a, um, a regular athlete for the first time, although we're all born athletes. This is the first time I was really expressing that part of myself. And I was working with a trainer who was wonderful. 27 years old guy. No kids, never married, never went through breast cancer, never had a period in his life, doesn't know what it's like to be in perimenopause. And so although I got, you know, the, the education that I needed as, as, a, as a training client, I felt that I had all of that to offer in addition to the empathy, the understanding, the point of view of what it's like to be a mom, what it's like to have to go home and take care of kids. So one day I had an epiphany at the gym. Uh, as, as a personal training client, I looked around at all the trainers and I said, I can do this mm -hmm. and I can do it better. And again, it's not that my trainer was doing it wrong, but there was a whole legion of people like me that needed someone who had a little bit more of their personal life experience. My trainer had been in the NFL. Okay. I had never been in the NFL. <laughs> so there really was this disconnect between who he was and who I was. I needed to be find a trainer that was a little bit more similar to me to get me to where I want to go. And that's who I want to be for my clients is I wanted to be that one that, that gets who you are and what else you've got going on in your life. In addition to giving you one heck of a workout, uh, it was just a little bit more understanding and that there's needs to be some balance and not every workout can be uh, like you're training for the Olympics. Some of them need to be re restorative. Some of them need to be um, just dealing with, things that are going on in their heads. We use exercise in the gym to exercise what's going on in their heads sometimes. So, you know, long story is I knew that as a personal trainer, I had a lot I could bring for what people are looking for in training is not just the physical, but the, the head game and people who are midlife transformation people. I get it. And I've been very, very effective with people, you know, that are seeking that kind of trainer. Well, I think it's important because it's not just the exercise. We know exercise is good for us, but it's hard. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can gather all that other stuff, you're right. How do you fit that in with life, which is very difficult. And as we age, you know, I think, you know, this is the Weathered Athlete podcast, you know, 50 right. plus. And part of the thing is we all come with some baggage of some sort. And again, it's maybe not personally, like I haven't gone through breast cancer, but I've had friends that have gone through it. And again, those life experiences are what help us to succeed. And I think having someone like you as a, as a trainer, 
you can understand that just because it says on that paper, okay, I need to do this workout today. Um, maybe there's some things, you know, it doesn't always fit with life that we can kind of work around that and change things. And you, so I think you have a great perspective. Well, thanks. And I want to take this time to just kind of give you some of the scripting that I give my clients in the gym. Mm -hmm. Um, especially things like goal setting, uh, 100% of the people that come to me have some aesthetic in mind. They want to look a certain way or they want a number on the scale or they want a size of their clothing. Those are their goals. And through training with me, I help them realize that those are the side, those are the side effects that whatever weight you end up being is the weight you're going to end up being. That's not the ultimate goal. What we're looking for is happiness. Mm -hmm. And physically, when it comes to exercise, I liken it to my party days in college. I said, I know what it's like to be high, mm -hmm. and I know what it's like to be hungover. Mm -hmm. It feels good, then it hurts. Okay, and it hurts bad. Dehydration is one. I mean, you nauseate, you regret, yeah. mystery bruises, yeah, <laughs> things like that. But when you're in a gym and you're working physically intensely, now there's a difference between effort and suffering. When you're in the gym, there's an effort and it can be uncomfortable because your body's not used to it. But this is not suffering. Exercise is a privilege. We get to do this. This is fun. We're here together. We're having a good time in this beautiful gym on this beautiful day. Let's have some fun. And what I do is I say, exercise is the hangover before the high. You put in the effort, the pain. And then in that moment when you're resting after a rep, after repping out, say, 12 quad extensions and you sit and you feel your quads that pain, that burning goes away. And suddenly it's the sensation of, of calm, of peace. It feels good. Yeah. And I tell my clients, this is it. This is why you're here. These little doses of feeling good. We're going to do this 12 times three during this hour. And then you're going to go out the rest of your life. You're going to find these little doses of feeling good. And that is what's going to get you to your goals. But in the meantime, you're supposed to be enjoying the journey. Yeah. And they just love that, the hangover before the high. Yeah. I love that economy of energy much better. So exercise might be effort, mm -hmm. but it's a heck of a lot easier than a hangover. Yeah. And the end result is a lot better. Yeah. So as far as, let's go you personally, uh, do you set day-to-day -day goals? What, how do you handle things? I do. Every morning I have um, sort of a routine, as other people might call it prayer, or they might call it meditation. I have just some exercises that I go through to set some goals for that day. Mm -hmm. um, and the real ones are, you know, the physical goals, like I need to get the bills paid and taxes done and whatever, mm -hmm. feed the kids. Um, and then every day I also have some goal about what I want to be working out in my mind. What is today's issue that is going to be resolved? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, this morning I had to overcome a little bit of nervousness about doing my very first podcast ever. <laughs> so I did a little bit of meditation, you know, thinking about how I want this to go, how I want it to end up. Yeah. And then enjoying the process. And hopefully we're going to end up with something decent you're going to be able to put out for other people to listen to. You're doing awesome. <laughs> uh, as far as, yes, of course, like everybody else, I've got quarterly, monthly, quarterly, yearly financial goals. And I've used that sort of discipline to give myself, uh, you know, goals uh, as far as fixing up my house, fixing up my body, my wardrobe, everything. Yes. I set goals every day. And I... um reassess them. Sometimes I have goals that I've been working for for a while that I just, I, it's just not worth working for anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So it's okay to be flexible. That's the other thing that I've learned is um, I used to call myself all or nothing Annie. Yeah. And it's like, if I didn't do a thousand percent or if I didn't do it all, then I wasn't doing it right. And it's like, well, it's not everything is supposed to be done at a hundred percent. Some things are just little tastes in life and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, with goals, I think, especially, you know, I do triathlons and, and marathons. And, you know, for people that get into that, they put that out there. And so, you know, you have that event. Um, and then, you know, last year, everything got taken away. So right. I think the people that succeeded are were able to build those still day to day goals or month or week to week goals or month goals um, to be able to stay on target. Uh, because once that that end goal is taken away from you. It's hard. And I don't think people are setting day-to-day -day goals um, like that. I'm trying every day, to, just like you, trying to evaluate what is my accomplishment for today? What do I want to do? And then I reevaluate the next day. And if it's maybe I look at it and it's been there for five days and I still haven't gotten to it, I'm like, maybe I can get rid of that. Maybe that's not something I need to work towards. 
Um, but I think if we don't do that, we just kind of aimlessly go through life and that's where, well, I, I need to go to the gym, but now maybe I'll do it tomorrow. And right. if you don't actually put that down, um, it, it's difficult to stay on task. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think for all of us, especially during pandemic, we've had to reassess our goals and how we're going to get there. Yeah. Um, it, here's a wonderful example, Pete, you'll love this, is, um, you know, I'm a personal trainer. I'm in the gym seven days a week training other people, and I, I personally am working out there. My gym was shut down. Does that mean I don't work out? Nope. Does that mean, though, that I have to do exactly what I was doing in the gym to get a workout? No, it doesn't. You know, gyms haven't always been around, but human beings have been around for millennia. Mm -hmm. You know, we've managed to find physical fitness outside of a gym. Yeah. Like, so it's like, well, let's just go back to the basics. What were we doing? We're hunter-gatherers. Let's go run around outside for a while. And yeah. for me, last year, a lot of my working out, I took up gardening. Okay. And it wasn't just pulling weeds and planting seeds. I was hauling rock by hand. I mean, I think over the course of two months, I hauled like four tons of rock <laughs> one handful at a time. It was fun, but that was my workout in addition to getting sunshine and yeah. creating something beautiful. So I think for pandemic, we needed to rethink what it is to get a workout in as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that functional, um, again, I'm a PT, I'm a functional type of guy, you know, we can we can find ways to to work activity into your day. You know, I think the traditional of I have to go to the gym is it's not necessary. Or that, that, but. that mentality that unless I go to the gym, I haven't worked out. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it, you need to be more flexible. We all need to be more flexible in, in how we're going to get to our goals when we can't get to the gym or wherever else we want to go. OK, so as far as, you know, leaning on other people, I know some people are very intrinsically motivated. And, and I know that you, know, you had all those things that happened to you and you basically said, I'm going to do this. How helpful was it having a team around you? Did you have other people that kind of helped you, I guess, just start that journey? Absolutely, I did. And I had to seek them out. Mm -hmm. When I went through a divorce, when I was married, I had a husband. So that was my number one person that I went to in all things, you know, and then we would talk and maybe I'd have to go seek help from somebody else on a certain, you know, whatever. But um, and then during my divorce, I also had my best friend of 22 years, my closest female friend basically divorced me. We got into a bit of a falling out. And she hasn't spoken to me since. Um, well, that's not true, but we haven't spoken like we, we used to. Um, so I lost my primary male relationship and my primary female relationship. The two people that I always went to first mm -hmm. to get that information. I think, you know, originally it's your mom and dad. Yeah. Then for me, it was my husband and my best friend. And I lost that. And so I'm trying to navigate this journey. But it, it was a very good exercise for me to stop and think, who can help me? Let's not just go to that one person and dump everything and expect them to know what to do. It was very good for me to be resilient and resourceful. Okay. I have an issue right now with this part of my personal training business. Well, I'm not going to run to my ex-husband for that. I go to my mentor, my personal trainer who has a, per a successful business, Adam, help me. What do I need to do in this? Um, you know, if I'm having trouble with a, a recipe or something, I'll call my sister-in-law because she's really good at being a cook. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it was trying to be more inventive of who I sought out and to do that appropriately, because sometimes when you ask someone for help, that's a burden for them. They feel obligated to help you. And if they don't have the skills to help you, then they're not fulfilling your request. And so I, I needed to be kinder to people. Who am I coming to for help? You, can you give me the kind of help that I'm looking for? Okay, that's good. So you said your gym is opening up in a couple of days? It's been open. Uh, our governor opened up Minnesota gyms uh, last month. I think it was the end of December. Um, but my my clients, me, I just, we just weren't ready yet. My children are going back to school on Monday as well. So that was sort of why I chose that day to go back. Oh, okay. That's good. They're, they're not coming flooding back. I mean, yeah. all 25 of my clients are not signed up this week. I've got maybe two, but that's okay. okay. So people will come back when they're ready to come back. Okay. And then, so we talked a little bit, you're doing some strength training. Are you doing any running or anything right now? What do you do for cardio? Uh, shoveling snow. <laughs> I live in Minnesota and I live in a townhouse. I don't have to shovel snow. I never have to shovel it. My association does that. I always make sure that I get out there first to shovel my deck, my patio. My I love shoveling snow. It's a great workout. It brings people out of their houses. Annie, what are you doing? We don't have to shovel our driveways. Well, come on out. Let's do it anyway. This is a great exercise. 
And uh, one of the things I've learned as a Minnesota girl is if you don't take joy in the snow, you're going to have less joy in your life and the same amount of snow. Yeah. So it doesn't, I grew up in Buffalo. I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. So I know what. <laughs> but honey, I think you got it worse than I do. I think New York is worse than Minnesota when it comes to snow. Yeah, that's why I live in North Carolina right now. <laughs> we, I like seeing it, but I, I don't miss the shoveling. But it was a great workout, I will tell you that. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, someday I may live in the desert as well, and uh, snow will be nothing but a wonderful memory for me. Yeah. Um, so as far as what do you think is like the most important um, thing that's kept you going? What is the most important thing that has kept me going? Wow, I've never, I, honestly, I can't remember ever being asked that. What is, what's my motivation yeah. for continuing to go on? Well, I can tell you it wasn't something I chose. It was actually something people like you gave me. And that was, I keep being told that I'm an inspiration. Mm -hmm. That people see what I've done and they find inspiration to make changes in their own life or re-examine ways that they're living so it isn't that I'm here to provide anybody with rules for living, but mm -hmm. to provide you inspiration to question what isn't working in your life. And it's okay to uh, break those molds that have been put on you from birth yeah. and just be your authentic self. Yeah. So I guess I'm going to lead into that. So if you had, yeah, I think I already know the answer, but I'm asking anyways, mm -hmm. if you went back to your 25 year old self and were yeah. able to sit down and have a conversation, what would that be like? Uh, it would be a very brief conversation, and it would be just this. Annie, all the happiness you have ever wanted, all the happiness you're ever going to need is inside of you, mm -hmm. not in a store. It's not in the bottom of a bottle of wine. It's not in a relationship. It's inside of me. Yeah. And uh, so that is, that's that's my guiding force. I've got all this happiness that I just want to spill out all over everybody, but I still have to figure out how to access it. I still got some filters and things that are really keeping my happiness at bay. So this is a process. Life is a journey. Just like fitness is a journey. It's a yeah. verb. It's what we do yeah. is we stay fit. It's not like the, okay, I'm fit now and I don't have to do this anymore. Um, so happiness is also one of those things that continues to build and continues to be revealed. And, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that once we shuffle off this mortal coil, it's the happiness that I get to take with me. And I believe that that's true. I believe that my purpose for being here is to spread happiness and to be inspiring so other people can find their own. Yeah, that's great. So now jump at the other direction where yeah. you see yourself in 20 years from now, what do you want to be doing? Uh, you know, it's so funny because some of the things that I want are some of the things that my family, my society has told me my whole life I'm supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be very, very honest, although I wasn't successful the first time around, I love being a wife. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I am looking for that relationship in life, the one that seems to be elusive for all of us. Well, not for all of us, for many of us. I see you have a wedding ring on, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> happily married. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking for marriage. I want yeah. to get back out there again. Um, I've been dating and right now I'm not because it hasn't been uh, very successful for me. But, so that is a big hurdle. I know that is something that I'm capable of doing. I know that I'm capable of being part of a primary relationship with someone and being a supportive loving person and him being a supportive, loving person in return. So when I see myself 20 years from now, I see exactly who you're seeing right now. I see a trainer. I see a model. I see a woman who's confident and happy and growing. And until the day I die, I hope that I'm growing. I just would really like at this point to share that on a day-to-day -day basis with somebody else. My kids are going to move up, uh, grow up and move out. They're supposed to. Yeah. I'm looking kind of for someone who's going to be with me for a while and i'm going to tell you it terrifies me it mystifies me i have no idea how i'm going to get there but damn what i'm gonna yeah it, it'll happen then you know the right thing it, it comes along when you're least expected it and when you don't look for it it'll be there <laughs> and, and as far as there, that's just the only one guy out there yeah. i know that that's not true there's probably tens of thousands of yeah. men that would it's just timing and whatever. But what I keep reminding myself is he's out there looking for me too. Yeah. And how oh, damn mad would I be if he quit? So yeah. I'm not <laughs> looking for him. I love it. I love it. Yeah. COVID this year has been very difficult, I think, for for anybody because you've taken away any ability to socialize and be out there and do anything. It's just hard. 
I'm sure. It was hard enough to figure out something to do for a date when everything was open. And now when nothing's <laughs> open, it's like, oh, okay, maybe I just won't date right now. That's too awkward to even find something to do. <laughs> just keep working out. Keep doing what you're doing now. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, so as far as like recovery, since you're really not doing long endurance events, do you, what does recovery mean to you? Uh, recovery to me is, uh, refocusing every day on, on why I'm doing this. Uh, it's for me, my injury was mental health. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that. I didn't break a hip or tear my Achilles tendon or anything like that. My handicap has always been mental health. And uh, so part of my recovery is working on my mental health every day. And it is an endurance event, Pete. It definitely is an endurance event. Again, I, I've told you my morning uh, routine that I do to remind myself, you know, what my goals are. And that's always helpful to be positive. Um, you know, and then Pete, just interacting with other people. I'm a much happier person than I used to be. Yeah. My relationships show it. My conversations with people show it. So those are things that I use as, as feedback tools that I am on the right track. Yeah, that's great. I, I think those, um, you know, physical, we're good with, with physical scars, and, but we're not doing a really good job when it comes to depression right now and how to help people because, you know, we're so used to, we need to see it. And it's something we don't, you'll see the manifestations of it sometimes, mm -hmm. but by then it's, it's difficult. What advice do you have for people to try to help somebody else who's maybe going through what you went through? Is there, I know there's no one right answer, but what, what recommendation do you have for other people or what do you do to help other people? You're not in this alone. Yeah. We are here as a society. We are put here for each other. Uh, I was raised Catholic. It's biblical. We, God is not here physically like he was when he was, you know, incarnate as Jesus. God is here within all of us. Um, I don't use those terms anymore. I say love and happiness, the universe, our spirit is all around us. Um, depression is a very isolating and um, you're, you're too focused on things. Uh, you need somebody else to give you the wide angle lens of what's really going on in your life. Uh, you know, you are the astronomer. Life is the telescope. Look through it and see everything that you want to see. Um, so my number one thing to people who are, suffering in their head is do your best to get out of your head and invite other people to help you sort it out because you're just going to start for me i had lies i lied to myself all the time and so i needed that reality check from outside forces to let me know that all right i need to get that out of my head to clear the way for the happiness that's inside of me to come out um, I tried to kill myself and it was the 1970s and that's when depression was largely considered a personality flaw, a defect of character and not enough strength um, as opposed to a diagnosable medical condition that could have, you know, that could be treated. Yeah. Uh, so in the 1970s, despite the fact that my mother was a healthcare professional, nobody sought any healthcare for me. Uh, I took over 150 pills and I threw up they never took me to the emergency room to see if I should have my stomach pumped. Wow. Um, and so you can see why I, I don't really want to talk about this because it reflects poorly on me as a suicide attempt, but it, re yeah. it reflects really poorly on my parents and the society that we lived in in the seventies and that mental health was a personality flaw yeah. that uh, recognize it as snap out of it, cheer yourself yeah. up. It's a serious thing that needs to be addressed. And when it is addressed in that way, it can be overcome. Yeah, you know, I grew up in the same, I'm close to the same age you are. I grew up, uh, you're in a bad day, just get over it is all we got growing up. And oh, you'll be fine. And yes. now tomorrow's better. But it was never anything done. And I think, you know, unfortunately now I look at really all stages. I, you know, I think we have issues with our teenagers right now. I think, you know, it was tough enough to go. I said, that you want to punish somebody? Make them go back to be a teenager again. That right. is the number. That is the number one punishment you could do to somebody. Is make them do their teens all over again. <laughs> There's no way I'll take anything other than going back to be a teenager. Teenager. Right. Um, but I think the you know the phones and everything going on right now. I think people are just so distracted that we've lost we've lost touch with I think reality. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right, and I, I have a really good example of that for you. My uh, my youngest, my 13 year old, is in seventh grade. And for the first, he was in the same school up through the end of sixth grade. So this year he's a new kid in a new school. 
So obviously um, he started in September hybrid. I mean, my kid was only going two days a week, so he didn't get the full experience and has not gotten to, to meet a lot of people at his new school. And I find out now that my son is downstairs talking to all of his buddies from his old school all the time. And it's like, okay, we're, uh, it's great that he's still developing those relationships and holding on to them, but he's not getting an opportunity to develop relationships with the new kid in his new school. Um, and that's got to be tough because relationships are tough when you're a teenager. Yeah. My gosh, but not being able to nurture and grow them. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that my kids get to go back to school on Monday, at least for two days a week. Yeah, that's good. So are you still drinking at all right now? Yes. Yes, I do. I just, I don't drink like I used to. I used to drink to get drunk. I used to drink to party. Uh, now I do enjoy a glass of wine as an enhancement to a lovely meal. I, I get the art of alcohol now, the, the, the beauty of, of alcohol. You know, there's, there's real artists that make, that create these things. Uh, I have recently taken up uh, sipping scotch. Man, is that great on a cold winter day? That thing, that is instant warmth from yeah. the you know, your entire body warms up. So I'm I'm liking scotch, but again, it's not to check out. It's not as a tool. It's just part of my enjoyment of life in moderation, of course. And I love that. So that's perfect. Um, so if we go back to like, what age groups are you training right now? All of them. All of them. Okay. Uh, my youngest is a teenager. Uh, in fact, he's a special needs child, and we have gotten some permission from the school district. I'm actually his gym teacher. He gets his fly ed credit from training with me. Um, although that's not a service that I normally offer. This was a very special thing that I got permission from his school district to do this. So that's one of my, my lower end clients. He's uh, 17. Okay. And then most uh, of my clients then are adults, 18 and above, uh, mostly my age. Uh, okay. People, in their, you know, 40s and 50s, you know, people that can relate to me. That's why they chose me as a trainer. They they know that I get what they're going through in life right now. Um, uh, I'm sorry. What was your next question, sir? Uh, next question. So you're not really seeing anybody in their 60 and over. Are you seeing anybody that age? Yes, I am. Have... Yeah, yeah um, I am. It's, it's difficult now because, of course, of pandemic, the senior population is not coming to the gym. Yeah. So the seniors that I do have are uh, virtual and technology is hard. So I'm just, I'm having a hard time delivering my product to the senior population. Uh, but when we you know when the gyms are open again, I hope to get back, have them come back. Okay, that's great. Um, and then do you have anything? I have one last question, but I'll save that until do you have anything else you want to talk about that we did not talk about? Well, just a little bit about the kind of clients that I'm attracting okay. as a personal trainer. We talked about my motivation for being. So the result is when I first got out of personal training school, I cavalierly and just very arrogantly believed that I would be making all of my money off of women like I used to be, the spoiled suburban housewives. Mm -hmm. Basically, I thought I'd be running an adult daycare. These are the women <laughs> that show up to the gym with makeup on. They don't want to sweat because they're going out to lunch afterwards. I really thought that that's who my clients were going to be. And um, I've never had one, not even one woman, mm -hmm. not one person like that. Last year or a couple of years ago when my, I was up and running and really assessing the demographics of my clients, out of the 25 active clients I had at the time, I was thrilled to find out that seven of them had PhDs. I had an MD. I had a physician's assistant, a DDS, a lawyer. I'm attracting highly educated people. Mm -hmm. I'm the thinking woman's or the thinking person's trainer. And that dovetails really nicely with my impression of myself of being a nerd. Uh, I, I always liked being a student, although I didn't do well in the uh, social part of school. I liked being an academic and I'm attracting people who also were into academia and now we're doing this physical thing together. So it's really, really fun. It's much different than I thought it was going to be. It's better than I thought it was going to be. That's cool. So as far as like setting up their plans, um, obviously you're setting up training plans for all these, for these people. Yes, I am. Okay. And are but, any of them, um, so is it just strengthening or any of them trying to train for any like endurance events or anything? Uh, well, when it comes to personal training, as you know, Pete, because you're a physical therapist, is that there's many different affects I can have on a muscle. I can train it for stability. I can train it for endurance. I can train it for hypertrophy, which we call bodybuilding, mm -hmm. power and speed. And as a personal trainer, I need to give a, you know, a, a big picture 
experience of what exercise is like. And so actually during COVID, we have been doing endurance training. Yeah. That's what I do. I don't have clients doing high weight, low reps. We're doing low weight, high reps, endurance, because honestly, right now, that is the energy that all of us need. We need to endure this time in our life. We need to get through this pandemic. Um, so yes, I do train people for bodybuilding competitions. I train models for photo shoots, but mostly the endurance that I'm training for is people for life. Okay. And that's exactly what we need to be doing. Yeah. So how about breath work? Are you doing any breath work yourself or do you train your uh, clients in any breath work? I myself do personally every morning. Um, okay. I'm, uh, I used to smoke. Uh, I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day from 15 to 25. And so still today, and my father died of lung cancer 11 years ago. So between the end of my smoking and the end of my life, I am in this time working on my lung health. And so I breathe and do meditations every day. And of course, breathing is part of exercise. Mm -hmm. You exhale on the exertion, you inhale on the, um, you know, on the recovery part. Uh, so we talk about breath work all the time, but in the context of it kind of being part of the whole system that we're working right now, not specifically a bicep or a quad. Yeah. Breathing is part of the whole person. Okay. Um, what techniques do you use personally, if you don't mind me asking? For breathing? Yeah. Uh, mine is visualization. I close okay. my eyes. So I think it would be most closely related to what people call meditation. Okay. So I bring myself inside and I feel, I see myself inside my lungs. I am inside my lungs, visually looking up at the balloons of them expanding okay. in and out. So I, I'm a very visual person. So I always have to have pictures in my head. Okay. So you're not using like say a four, seven, eight breath, breath cycle or nasal breathing or anything. You're just doing a breath and making sure just the, the visualization of just expanding and making sure you're getting all your lungs. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. It's simple and it's easy to remember. Breathe. What I tell people is your lungs are balloons. They expand in all directions. You've heard about chest breath and belly breath. Yeah. I like just big breath. Yeah, that's good. I know because COVID's forced us all to really pay attention to our breathing, especially if you're wearing a, a, a mask. Oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> yeah. As a PT, I'm wearing a mask and a face shield every single day. And that's one of the things I, I hope that will come out of this is that I think we will pay attention a little bit more to our breathing. I don't think we ever really thought of it. And then now we have to wear a mask and in North Carolina here, they want you to wear a mask when you're exercising. So if, especially if you're in a gym, it's hard enough to start with, to breathe with a mask on, just walking around or just with normal activities and to go out and try to run with it. It's, it's pretty difficult. Yeah. Um, here in Minnesota, we have uh, not, not for me specifically, but I have seen news reports and talked to other parents who's the little ones are back outside for the outdoor activities. So hockey, ice skating, those kind of things are happening, but even outdoors, the, the hockey players are supposed to be wearing face masks while they're exercising. And they say, science says that it does not curtail your breathing, but these little kids are being affected by it. They don't yeah. like wearing these masks. They're having a hard time playing their game. So I, I agree. I think we have some challenges about how much of this is, is truly it's impeding our breathing or we're just not used to having our faces covered. Um, I, I found it interesting when we were first told to start wearing these masks, people are refusing to wear them. Yeah. And it, I thought about what happened in our society the first time we decided we all needed to wear pants. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm not covering up my genitals. I'm letting my genitals fly, you know. Yeah. And so like, people are like, I'm not covering up my mouth and nose. It's like, well, that's what our society is asking us to do now. And I'm a functioning member of the society. So I'm going to do what society says. And I'm going to cover my face and my nose when I'm out in public with a mask. Um, thank you, mask manufacturers that you make them. I can breathe through them. I do appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, and I think it's we're basically all doing inspiratory muscle training right now with that on. So hopefully, if anything, I use it as endurance training. You know, I'll see when I can finally get out there and start doing events again if it's made a difference. If I feel like I actually can breathe better when it's off. Right, right. Oh, Pete, that just reminded me. I'm sorry, I don't know if you'll be able to use this, but when I was in personal training school, one of my classmates would wear one of those elevation masks. Yeah. He would bike ride in Colorado all the time. And I remember having to put him through a power set, a power training um, set. And he's wearing this mask. And it was like something out of a Batman movie. <laughs> you know what character I'm talking about? Or yeah, Darth I do. Or he's just <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> <you're> dying. <laughs> 
I'm sorry. I don't know if you can use that, but man, that just that popped into my head right now. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Well, have deliberately exercise by impeding the, their breathing. So. Yeah, there's some science behind it. So it, it, it's going to be interesting. I think we're going to be, when we can finally all start doing events, people are going to be shot out of a cannon. You know, they're going to be ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We're going to go nuts. It's going to be fun. But, you know, I, I have, we've all studied world history. And you remember there was something in the Middle Ages called the plague, yeah. right? Awful. Bubonic plague. Uh, it, it, uh, worse ways to die uh, than COVID. Believe me, dying of the bubonic plague would be awful. Um, but what happened during that? Life went on. Yeah. Babies were still born. People were still falling in love. Life, society was still, although differently, was still moving on. And what happened after the plague? The Renaissance. Yeah. Art, music, math, human thought and society and culture had an exponential growth. Yeah. I am so excited for our renaissance that yeah. we are living and we get to make it happen. Yeah. Um, we get to, you know, think new things and have bright, shiny new thoughts now after this pandemic because we couldn't while we were in pandemic. So I'm yeah. really excited for the 2021, 2022 cultural, social renaissance. I'm going to be front and center. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I agree with you 100%. I definitely think we're going to be ready to, to go once we come out of that. So I don't want to keep you much longer, but, you know, I typically end with, uh, I use a hashtag, my miles are four as a way to kind of, for me to focus on why I do things in, in life and on, and basically as I'm training. How about for you? If you use the hashtag, my miles are four, what is it for you? Oh, Pete, thank you for asking me this. Yeah. Hashtag, my miles are for inspiring everyone, including myself. Awesome. I love it. And uh, Annie, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, I have a website, amarkfitness.com, um, and I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Reach out. Find me. It's Ann Marquis, M-A-R-Q-U-I-S. If you call me Ann Marquis, I will answer to it, but that's not how I pronounce my name. <laughs> and you have a blog, correct? Uh, my blog is on my website. Yeah, uh, yeah there's, there's a lot of bits and pieces of my story that are up there for you to look for. Um Part of my future also is uh, to get this story comprehensively out to the world so you can hear what I went through and learn from my mistakes without repeating them. Yeah. Uh, and Pete, I got to thank you. This is truly my first comprehensive opportunity to tell my story. How did I do? You did awesome. I mean, <laughs> fantastic. Do you go by Ann or Annie? I want to make sure I got that yeah. right. Ann? Ann, yep. Okay. Uh, I was raised Catholic. It's the biblical Ann. <laughs> mother of Mary. I'm Jesus' it, grandmother. It is. My wife's Marissa and your middle name, Ann. You know, you got to make sure you have that. <laughs> so I know oh, how it is. To us, yes. There's Ann's <laughs> without the E. There's Ann's with the E. And there's Annie's, but I'm an Ann with the E, not an Annie. How's that? Oh, that is so funny. I yeah. just took a school name and made it very complicated. Yes, I know. Hey, this was awesome. I yeah. so appreciate you deciding to actually do this. Thank you for this opportunity. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and were able to gain some insight into how one weathering athlete uses her experiences to stay as injury-free as possible. As a physical therapist, I'm trained to help people overcome their physical scars, whether it's from an injury, from an activity, or from surgery. The thing that I think I struggle with and I think a lot of people do as well are those scars that we cannot see. What do we do to help somebody who's dealing with depression? Uh, growing up it was you'll be fine, you'll get over it, it'll be better the next day and maybe that's true but uh, I think we need to do a better job than that and I think we have. I think it has become more out in the forefront, especially if we look at uh, suicide prevention with with our military, uh, I think we're we're trying to do a better job. My hope is that with people like Anne uh, speaking about the issues that they they have dealt with in the past and the ways that they have overcome it, my hope is that it'll provide some inspiration to other people to say that there is a way out of this, uh, 
there are also some steps that you need to take. If you are suffering and you know somebody, uh, seek out help. Talk to a professional. Let them help you set up the guideline and the steps that you need to take. Uh, I will include the number for suicide prevention um, on the bottom of the show notes. Um, also, reach out to a friend. Uh, as a physical therapist, I'm an exercise guy. Uh, getting outside, going for a walk, and being in the environment, having people around you will also make a difference. Uh, help realize that you are not alone. There are other people that value you, and it's so important that you do that. Um, again, the only thing I can say is you are not alone. If you've listened to any of these podcast episodes, you will find that everyone that is in here has come through some weathering of some type. And it's through that weathering process that we develop character and resilience to move forward. So I encourage you to take that first step, put foot to pavement, and keep moving forward. I love Anne's mindset moving forward is basically to use love and just enjoy her experiences. So I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Please don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a comment, and share with your friends. As always, my miles are for the journey. Pete Barusik.